exclusive AP Chemistry video. That's right, it doesn't get more exciting than this. We are talking about the structure of ionic solids, metals, and alloys. I know you guys are just as excited as I am to get started in this video, so let's get going. In today's episode, students will be able to explain how ionic solids form crystalline structures and that their organization is to minimize repulsive forces while maximizing attractive ones. We're also going to be able to evaluate metallic bonding and how interstitial and substitutional alloys are formed. Exciting episode today, short episode today, so I know you guys are really pumped for that. So let's talk a little bit about ionic compounds, and they form in a way that minimizes the repulsive forces and maximizes the attractive forces. So as a result, they form what is known as a crystal lattice structure. They're evenly spaced out, and they form these crystal-like structures. Now, there are actually three different types of crystal structure, and this really depends on the type of ions that are present. Now, you do not need to know the three different types, which are down in the bottom right-hand corner, simple cubic, body-centered cubic, and face-centered cubic. But be aware that they do form in a way that minimizes the repulsive forces and maximizes the attractive ones. So you're typically not going to find two things with a positive charge next to each other or two things with a negative charge next to each other. The strength of the bond is relative to the charge of the ions and the size of the atom, just like what we've talked about previously. Larger charges means that there's going to be a greater attraction. If the charges are the same, then what we focus on is the atomic radius. Remember that larger atoms tend to have larger radii. And as a result, when they bond, the distance between the two nuclei is longer. A longer distance between the nuclei means that the bond is not as strong. And so as a result, you're going to have a lower melting point. Stronger forces result in a higher melting point. So keep in mind, it's all about the strength of the bond. And that's relative to the charges of the ions and the size of the atom. When we look at metallic bonding, we talked a little bit about this in the last video. Remember that metallic bonding is represented by an array of positive metal ions surrounded by delocalized valence electrons. So those valence electrons do not stay on the individual ions. They're kind of in an ocean, so to speak, and they tend to move around quite a bit. That's what allows most metals to have a very strong ability to carry an electrical current. There are two types of alloys that are formed, and alloys are just a combination of two or more metals. The first one is what's called an interstitial alloy, and these form between atoms of very different radii. Smaller atoms fill the spaces between the larger atoms. So an example of that would be iron and carbon, which make up steel. This forms an interstitial alloy. There's no substitution of the iron atoms on the outside, but carbon atoms fill the spaces in between. Carbon atoms can do this because their atomic radius is smaller than that of iron. And lastly, we have what's known as a substitutional alloy. Substitutional alloys form between atoms of a similar radius where one atom substitutes for another in the crystal lattice. So for example, brass with zinc and copper. Zinc and copper on the periodic table have a very, very similar atomic radius. So the atoms are not going to be able to fit in between the atoms like we talked about in steel, but rather they're going to replace the copper atoms to form the alloy such as brass. So make sure you understand the difference between a substitutional alloy, one where the atoms are substituted, and an interstitial alloy where smaller atoms find their way in between the atoms of the metal. And again, all of this depends on the size of the atoms that you are looking at. So keep in mind atomic radius when we're talking about alloys and metallic and ionic bonding. All right, folks, one last thing about ionic versus metallic bonding. Keep in mind that ionically bonded compounds are very brittle and break very easily. This is due to the fact that it has a very, very rigid crystalline structure. Now, they can conduct electricity when you put them into solutions as it does form ions. But notice what happens on the picture on the left-hand side when that ionic compound breaks. When there is stress, it forces the crystal to be in a position where you've got two negative charges that are close to each other or two positive charges that are close to each other. Remember, the whole point of ionic solids is to get to minimize the amount of repulsions and maximize the amount of attraction attractions. So as a result, when the stress occurs and you have negative charges near each other or positive charges near each other, they're going to repel, which is what causes it to break very easily and make it brittle. 
The crystal lattice structure is not very flexible. Metallic bonding, on the other hand, allows for malleability. You know that metals are malleable. They're bendable. They're flexible. You've taken a piece of aluminum and bended it and folded it before uh, without it breaking. And that is due to the fact that the electrons are delocalized. Okay? So when you do move around those positive charges, the delocalized electrons actually move with them. So as a result, um, you still have a, a bunch of positive and negative charges that don't interact or interfere with one another. So as a result, metallic bonding is much more flexible and allows for the conduction of electricities due to those delocalized electrons that allow it to carry the electrical current through the metal. It's the same reason on why it's malleable as well. We don't have a lot of those negative and positive repulsions in there even when the individual atoms are moved or stress is put upon the metal. So as a result, metallic bonding results in metals being far more malleable. Like I said, guys, a real quick video today. So hopefully you met the student learning objectives. It's a really exciting episode today. But what is going to happen next? What are we going to cover? Is it going to be Vesper theory? Is it Lewis dot structures? Are we going to be talking about moles? Who knows? Find out next time when J Lamb Bio takes you through the wonderful world of AP chemistry. This is Jay Lambio, signing out.